Hey, Scott, thanks for joining me. I do appreciate it. Sure, sure. Um, so people know you from the Folio series, from Art of the Genre. But what I'd like to do is start with like your beginnings in the TTRPG uh, community. When did you first start gaming? What games did you start with? And what made you fall in love with it, the industry as a whole? Uh, well, for my age group, I probably started like a lot of people um, with uh, the Elmore cover Redbox. Um, and, uh, you know, I got that, I think, from the, the Sears and Robot catalog. I had my mom get it for me in the early 80s. And uh, I started playing there. And then our uh, my middle school had like a DD and d club for, I don't know, maybe two months before, uh, you know, the, the satanic panic kind of shut it down. They said we couldn't do it anymore. But but it didn't matter like those 12 or 14 people probably kept playing for a while. And I, I certainly got some good friends out of there and I just continued to play. So that's where I really started uh, gaming per se. Yeah. All right. Um, and you also have a number of novels set in your uh, RPG world. When did you start writing? When did you, was it, was that, something you started writing before you created your modules or afterwards to help with the world building or how did you do that come about well i've always done um i've always liked to write and i always thought i could be a novelist um but uh you know it, it's it's a difficult path um mm -hmm. you know you, it, it's hard to get in with uh, uh publishers and stuff like that but one thing that i always did do um for my gaming groups um was I would take what we had done, um, and, and you know, a lot of times when you're playing D and D, it uh, goes. It, it's a lot of um, dice roll, so it's really the combats, right? And then you go from combat to combat to combat and collect your experience and your um, treasure. But what I always wanted to do um, was tell a story. Uh, and one of the things you don't get at your table as much. I mean, obviously you're role playing and there's stuff that's going to come out, but. Uh, I would do something that I called interludes, which would be um, if the characters had to go from point A to point B and we didn't play point A to point B, um, or what I would write what happened between point A and then I would then I would send it to my players. Um, and then I would compile those things into um, just books for, you know, for the players. So, um, and, you know, that's where I just started doing the story on story on story on story. And a lot of the stuff from my world, um, the Nameless Realms, where most of my stuff is set, came out of that. And then I thought, um, when, I, when I decided to do my first actual novel, um, I just was able to take all the things I've learned for 20 years of doing that and just kind of compress it into, uh, you know, a full length story. All right. Well, you mentioned uh, the Nameless Realms where uh, right. the Folio series takes place. Um, would you just give everyone a, an overview as how you see it in the, in the fantasy area? Because I know you also run stuff future into there. Um, right further on the line, but uh, where you're at, like so far in the folio, how, how would you give an overview of your world? Uh, well, the, the folio takes place in really uh, the end of, uh, I guess what would be the fourth age of uh, the Nameless Realms. And when I wrote stuff and we would jump around between things, I always thought it was very interesting to do um, families and family trees and where things came from and where things were going. So although I developed the Nameless Realm as a pure fantasy setting, the more I developed it and the more I wanted to, to kind of uh, weave in different timelines and ages, uh, I just created a full-on age, uh, listing of ages. I think I go from the first age to the 12th. And the 12th is like, you know, very high tech. Um, and then within there you have like you know the fall of civilization the fall of technology um, uh, and then you build back up again but anyway um so but most of my folio stuff is set in the the base fantasy fourth age um of the nameless realms but i do have some stuff um that i run which is kind of mage punk steampunk stuff um which is uh, set in an era i call the gun kingdoms um which is uh several ages forward uh in basically a uh, a time period where 
um, people without magic um, have wiped out all other magic or are trying to wipe out all other magic, and uh, they've used uh, new technologies to do so. So that that's one of the ages that of course uh some of my stuff like the folio digital quarterlies uh artifacts of adventure hardcover uh comprises some of those as well but anyway those are those are in there and then i wrote a couple books uh in, in the gun kingdoms uh as well with artist uh david dietrich who did so many great pieces for uh, uh battletech and space 1889 kind of stuff. Uh, you just mentioned some of the art right there so one of the the things about uh, art of the genre, it's, it's, while there's stories all throughout, the art is amazing in there. You know, you've got all of these amazing artists from your covers to the insides, people who understand the concepts of art. And, you know, it's not just one of those things, oh, I like to look at that, but the very fundamentals into it. How did you come to connect with all of these great artists and be able to get this art in um on your covers of your novels of the folios of your uh, orange spine hardcovers and such well it's kind of interesting uh you know there's an in-depth story kind of behind it i mean i was always very um taken uh with art uh, and like i said when i first started playing dungeons and dragons i i you know um i i said it's the elmore red box which it's really not <laughs> it's just on the cover of it but for me it's all more um and, and of course easily is within that uh as well but um he you know elmore does the cover of it and, and it was something to me i would always when i was very young i didn't read at all um and um at one point um i think i was i was going into sixth grade um and my mother who's an english teacher oddly enough um the the school came to her and said uh we just want you to know that uh your son can't read and she was like well, what are you talking about my son can't read and she was like they're like well he really can't read and so she like tested me and i couldn't uh that, that the failing of the school system like i could just get by without reading basically and so she took me on the, the summer of uh my sixth grade year between my sixth and seventh and then she tutored me all summer and i had to read like uh you know a, a bunch of uh you know teen kind of uh books in that age uh, bridge to terabethia and those kind of things and uh um so it got me functionally kind of being able to read again but i still couldn't read i didn't like to read but i i saw dungeons and dragons and, and if you got the the box that you had to read what was in it right to understand how to play the game and elmore was also doing um and at that time he was doing Dragonlance, the beautiful, beautiful Dragon Spot and Twilight in that, the, that series, the first Dragonlance series. And I would go into um, Walden books and this kind of stuff, and I would see these incredible uh, pieces of artwork on these covers. And it just basically forced me to have to read because I, I wanted to know what those covers were. Well, what, who were these people that were on the cover? And so um, my, my mother had a copy of The Hobbit um, that somebody... Uh, one of her students had given to her so i read that uh, and then i read uh, robert aspirin's hit or myth and then i finally was able to do the uh, uh, dragon spot and twilight and once i started doing that um i was able to you know i just was voracious i couldn't stop reading um and i just got everything i could but i really fell in love with and the motivation for me was, was this artwork um and i always really wanted to be you know to to talk to or understand or, or get stuff uh, made through this art. And I think it was about 2009, uh, you know, you had the internet and you had Facebook and that kind of stuff was coming around. And um, I just said, you know, I would like to do, I, I met uh, some publishers in uh, uh, the Black Eight magazine. And I said, I wanna do a series of articles on art, uh, RPG art in particular, um, and called Art Evolution basically taking how art in gaming started um, with D and Otis and Willingham and these guys and how it's gone all the way up to Wayne Reynolds and these other people um, who were doing art at the time. And um, so I went in and they, they approved the series of articles. I think there were like 18 or 20 of the articles uh, in, in total if you looked them up. But, um, and then I went out to each one of these artists and I said, 
um, I, I, you know, I, I went on searches and, and talked to some people and, and got different emails and was able to uh, communicate with them. And I said, there's, if I take one character, just a female wizard um, with dark hair who always wears white and gold. I said, just do your take on her in the style that you would have done when you're known from uh, for your gaming purposes and then uh it was kind of touch and go at the beginning where like air lotus was like no i'm not going to do that um because you've never been published before blah, 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 blah. and jeff uh Laubenstein, uh who has become a great friend of mine he actually did the cover for folio one um he said don't give up uh just go ask somebody else they'll do it and once i got elmore uh, and easily and stuff like that. And I had like a list of people who were doing it. Then all the others kind of fell in. Oh, Elmore's doing it. Of course I'll do it. Um, I never did get Aero Lotus, but ne nevertheless, uh, all these people did it. And uh, it was a lot of fun. But then after I made those relationships with them, I think one of the biggest things, if you're looking at the industry um, as a whole, it's, it's very small. Um, and once you can make contact with people and have a dialogue with somebody, um, if you want to, I think, have success in it, um, not to use those people, but to just have a running dialogue with them. I, I, you know, one of the things I did was I make sure, you know, I would email them once a week just to see how things were going. Hey, how you doing? Those kind of things, you know, and then you get to know people and they become friends of yours. And uh, that kind of, you know, steam drilled into different things. I found out that um, Jeff Easley had never done an art book. So we talked a lot about that. And then uh, eventually in, three years later by 2012 um i found out that jeff d was doing this new fangled thing called kickstarter where he uh was was redoing pieces of artwork that had been lost from old tsr uh very identically uh the old deities and demigods pieces and stuff like that uh, and i thought wow look at that and but i i knew i didn't have a name like d did um, so I went to Jeff Easley and I said, what if we did a book together? You did the cover and some interior pieces and I just wrote a book and then we just, uh, put it on Kickstarter and see, saw what happened. And, and Jeff was like, okay, let's do it. I think it sounds good to me. Um, so because of Jeff's kindness, <laughs> I was able to roll that into getting a book done and it was successful. And then I just, uh, thought that was successful. So why not do some more? So I ended up doing uh, I don't know, five, five or six books, I think. And then I did some anthologies, which were great, um, where I worked with a lot of great um, short story writers. Um, and I did the editing of those. Uh, and then um, after that, it was like 2015. And I thought these you know, books are a lot of work, um, but I've done so much gaming. Why not just see if I could do an, uh, an adventure? And that's where the first folio came around, because at that time I was working at Gygax Magazine, which was kind of the Dragon Magazine as well. The, the the lane that we were in but i was like what if somebody did something that was like dungeon um what we never done before and then as gygax was kind of falling apart i started putting out the folios and they became more adventures than really dungeon magazine but nevertheless um they kind of have the same aspects where i just the cover doesn't have to go with what's going on in the, in the module it's just a great fantasy cover kind of like uh, dragon magazine or dungeon magazine um, and then the adventures kind of came into play there and i had done this great campaign several times which was rosloff keep which of course you know mm -hmm. and uh i thought that's a perfect one to use it's six parts i think people like us great easy dungeons to go through and it has a great storyline that i developed over the course of you know 15 years i think um and uh it was it was successful and i was i been able to continue on since so but again it's always about the art or the people i knew and that's how i could get those covers um for those because i knew todd lockwood and i knew daniel horn and i knew jeff and you know uh, and elmore and i am um, in san diego so um i had become friends with nick parkinson uh who's keith's son but keith had passed away um and was able to work with him to get some of uh keith's pieces that had been published anyway it just kind of snowballed into this great thing but i was just, you know obviously you can see the, my wall behind me I've, i'm always got art that comes in so um but yeah that's always been my passion so when i do the folios it's really i look at it as not only just the adventure but how can I give it the same feel or inspiration that I had when I was a kid, when I see those pieces and I just go, whoa, you know, this is something that I want to do. All right. So you've, you started off, you started doing, you're like, oh, let's try this with Kickstarter. And you did the folios, uh, doing these adventures and everything, and you've gained a lot of success from them. Which, 
which of your folios are your favorite and why? Uh, I mean, that's tough. They're, they're all different. And it's kind of funny when I, when I do them in either three or sixes. And when I do the sixes, by the time I get to six, I'm like, I am so done with doing this. <laughs> this, this can I just move on to something else? Uh, so by the end of it, I'm always kind of a little bit eh, uh, on them, but I, I'm just happy that people like them and, and I think they end well. Um, I really, obviously, I really like Roslov Keep. I think it's a fantastic piece, but I think probably one of the most fun I had writing um, was The White Ship. Um, that was a campaign that we had played, um, you know, and like I said, I think I've talked to you about this before, uh, VIN, that, that, you know, everything I do, I've played. So it's not like the adventures, I'm just you know, making them up off the top of my head for the most part. So I know that they work and, and they've been on the table before. Um, but that was just a fantastic campaign. And it was a lot of fun to write and to put down. Um, and uh, I just had a great deal of fun doing it. And the white ship, which is involved throughout it, uh, is something that kind of had popped up in our, in the Nameless Realm and uh, for you know, 25 years um, since uh, we first, my, my DM that helped me write uh, uh, Roslov Keep uh, had done the Out Islands campaign back in the early 90s and the white ship would come. And it was, it, you know, so it's really this thing of lore so it's kind of fun to go full circle in that one and actually see what the white ship is and, and be able to get on it and, uh, um, you know, defeat the, the certain things on, on it. So that was probably my most fun to write, uh, to write. But then I, currently I'm in the process of writing through the Virgin Mine, which is also a lot of fun. Um, I'm having a good time with it too. Yeah. So with the, the Virgin Mine, uh, this is the one where you came up with like a unique way of, uh, keeping all the players low level. Um, so how did you come up with that concept? Because it's a very unique concept for keeping everyone at the low level and having that excitement of those low level adventures. Well, that was one of the things that I found, you know, I, I, I was coming off of um, Curse of Roslov Keep, which is a high level adventure. And considering I started it at high level, I mean, it, it's a high level adventure throughout. And then I was coming off riding the end of the white ship, which by that point, you're fairly high level at the end of the white ship. I was just kind of done with high level because as a DM, uh, when you're running high level, there's a, there's a lot of weight to it. Um, there's a lot of hit points. There's a lot of spells. There's all these things that you're kind of uh, having to keep track of and mitigate and your players are throwing stuff around. You're like, I didn't even realize you had that or you knew that or what these, you know, it's just, it gets really, really cumbersome. And so when I looked at the Virgin mine, I, I was looking for something different. Um, I wanted the players to not feel like they weren't find a way that they didn't feel like they weren't going up. They weren't advancing because that's one of the main onuses of Dungeons and Dragons going up levels, right? That's what you like. I want treasure and I want to go up levels. Um, that's why you play for the most part, mechanically speaking, obviously it's for the camaraderie of sitting at the table, but still um, I was looking at, I didn't want to take that away from them, but I was looking for an, a way to uh, allow them to keep the excitement of lower levels and low hit points and also give the DM a greater range of, uh, you know, just a way to play things and not feel like everything was just weighting them down because the characters just went up and up and up and up. And another thing about it is when you're playing a campaign um, and you're low level characters, you might go in and fight, let's say, a goblin keep or something like that, right? And then once you're out of the goblin keep, you're never really going to go against goblins again because you've kind of out leveled them. So then you're going to progress up to something else, uh, be that an orc or gnolls. And then very quickly you're into ogres and you skip so many great low level monsters um, be, uh, on that one course because you, you out level them. Um, so one of the things I was looking at was giving people within the Virgin Mind the ability to fight um, a lot of low level monsters that they would have out leveled um with the same character um so that's why you're going to have the ability to functionally fight goblins and lizard men and orcs and you know and hobgoblins and gnolls and stuff like that um all at all with the same characters because the levels are mitigated um and obviously when you come out of the virgin mine the reset happens so you're still 
you know, you're still at a high level, you still got those levels, you still got all that cool stuff. But when you're in, it just kind of mitigates you to have to be able to fight those things the way it is. So um, when I went in, we played it, we tested it. Um, you know, I thought it worked really well. And I just had to do a couple of wrinkles with it. But um, anyway, that was my that was my purpose there, giving giving players the ability to have their characters fight all of those classic monsters um, and still have those monsters be a threat. Obviously at seventh level, you can fight a goblin, but what's the purpose, you know? Um, but in this case, uh, you could still fight kobolds and those, those different things. Um, so that, that was what I was looking at, looking to do with it. Um, and I think so far it's gone really well. And I got, uh, and I'm doing something different too with the art um, that, uh, Justin Gerard is doing the covers for an entire set, which I've never done before. Every cover for the folio was a different artist, nothing back to back to back. Obviously, some artists did multiple covers, but not in a series. But uh, Justin is doing all the covers for this to make it kind of a coherent. He's such a great artist and guy for that matter. But, uh, I think it also goes well because his stuff is kind of, um, there's kind of a whimsical, comical uh, quality to it. Um, and I think, I think that that goes well with low level gaming, um, and which is what the virtual mind's about. Oh, really? Yeah. I mean, even my players, uh, you know, they went through Rosloff keep and then curse of Rosloff keep. And at first coming back to low level characters, they were like, wait, 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 this is so different, but they're kind of enjoying it. So I think both for the DM and the players, it can be nice to have those low level adventures after you've done, you know, like a year of higher, higher right. level and everything. Um, you know, speaking about how you have different artists do each of these covers, is there one of those covers that you could choose as a favorite cover? That's really hard uh, because I'm personally friends with everyone. Who did right. <laughs> uh, you know, so I don't want to necessarily single anything out. Um, I mean, some of the covers mean different things to me. Um, I, I'm, a, I'm a huge fan of Daniel Horns. Uh, he did Folio 4 uh, and uh, uh, Mesoamerica is uh, is something that I really really like. So that that priestess on the covers is gorgeous. Uh, uh, folio number three was Todd Lockwood's, and that's actually uh, a piece that he did just uh, the the character on it, and then for the series of articles that I did um, on Art Evolution. So that's that's Lissa. Um, the that protagonist that went all the way through Art Evolution. That's his version of her, and then he. Uh, put a background on it for me and um, so that's very special and Todd's a really really close friend of mine. Uh, folio number one was Jeff Laubenstein um, and all those characters on the front cover of um, folio number one are my characters and all my best friends characters that we played in Findolin, uh, a Findolin campaign in um, Nameless Realms uh, called the Griffin Bridge, and they're on the Griffin Bridge. So that's exceptionally important to me. Uh, and Jeff is exceptionally important to me because I, I would have given up because Errol would have just sent me away. Uh, but Jeff said no. So that's that's really important. And then uh, it's really funny, but the ones that always really catch my eye when I'm when I'm, you know, shipping them out to people are always the Chet uh, mittens and, and Ch Chet's hilarious. And he does such unique pieces. He did Folio 10, uh, 14, and 21. Um, and <laughs> this stuff is just awesome. It's very comical, but it is just great. Uh, and they always catch my eye. And I asked my other day, I was putting all of them out for a shipment. And I said, which, which are your favorites? And he actually went in and picked, he's 16 now, so then he picked 10, 14, and 21. <laughs> you picked all Chet's works. I'm sure, I'm sure Chet would feel good about that. Um, of all the great artists I've had. And of course, uh, the hardcovers are astounding because they're the beautiful, beautiful um, pieces that, uh, by the Four Horsemen. So, you know, you can't go wrong with a Parkinson and Elmore, a Caldwell, or an Easley. Uh, and that's when I went to do those hardcovers and compile all my folios. I really wanted to have that feel of the orange spines uh, that I really grew up with in the 80s. Um, I was a little too young to have done uh, the Trampier, uh, you know, uh, Player's Handbook uh, or the Sutherland DM's Guide. Um, 
I, I, of course I own those now and I played them on them, but, but when I went to, to buy them, those weren't available. So I, I grew up with uh, the, the Easley's and the Elmore. So um, those orange spines are really important to me. So when I went and compiled those, I wanted to get them as close as I could. And Easley was the perfect choice because he did every single one of those covers. I think they're nine, 10 uh, orange spines up on my shelf there. But, um, and then once I, he had done a few of those for me, I thought, well, wouldn't it be cool if we could just get all four of them? Um, so that's how I added Elmore and uh, Keith, who Nick gave me a beautiful piece of uh, Keith's. And then Clyde has done, um, he'll have done two for me now. Uh, the Curse of Rise of Keith, which you have, and then the complete uh, Black Label, which will be coming out very soon, which we just did a Kickstarter for in August. Um, but yeah, that's a great piece too. So anyway, yeah, uh, those are some of my favorites for sure. And then Justin, I mean, the, the new his new pieces are just awesome. Yeah, uh, what you were talking about, uh, um, Chet stuff, like the details he puts in stuff, that, it always just got me. I was like, oh my gosh, all this little detail work. I'm like, one day I've got to have him do it. And so, you know, I finally found him and I commissioned him to do stuff, uh, you know, for my characters from the Vendor Saga. I'm just like, man, this guy, his details, nobody does details like him. He's crazy yeah. with the details although his his artwork is no is nothing like russ nicholson uh uh who did so many pieces in the feed folio uh it is of the detail caliber of russ's um and yeah and sometimes i see chad and I'm like I, I i you know i just want to text him and say chad you gotta stop you, you gotta you gotta you know you, you're going over the top on it you know you gotta stop you can't you can't put this many details in everything you do but he just won't stop he just keeps going so uh yeah he's he's great and a great guy so you know i can't I can't get enough of his work and i you know hopefully obviously once i get done with uh the the current series i mean we'll see some more from chat and uh uh i'm doing a series uh the ice on the water series which um is going to be very osr uh, oriented and Chet's going to do uh, some of the covers for me on that. So that'll be a lot of fun. All right. So that's what's coming up, up after the Virgin Mine then? Yeah. Or it'll happen during the Virgin Mine. Uh, so I, I've currently got a black label up uh, on Indiegogo right now. That's Black Label 7. Uh, and that's introducing two new characters, a female protagonist. Um, and then I have folio number 28, which should be November. I'm going to kickstart it. And it's got a gorgeous cover as well. It's a lot of fun. It's the Howling Dungeon. So you're going to get into gnolls and flins and wolves and stuff like that. It's a lot of fun. And uh, sometime within there, I might run, maybe around the new year, I might run something for this little OSR trilogy that I'm doing, uh, where, where Chad will be uh, taking some of my artwork that I did when I was 13 and actually making it real artwork. <laughs> so using it as a guideline, but yeah. So, right. So, very good. So you mentioned uh, the black label one. So those are your more adult adventures, yeah. and you did those on Indiegogo instead of Kickstarter. Right. And uh, you were, you just you had two trilogies, and you put those together, and you made an orange spine out of them. Um, how is the popularity of the black label compared to uh, the regular folios? Well, it's weird because. Um... Black Label is run exclusively until the hardcover on um, Indiegogo. And Indiegogo is not Kickstarter. Uh, it, it's like Lyft versus Uber kind of thing. You know, it's just not as big. It doesn't have the exposure. And a lot of people aren't as familiar with it or don't have uh, or aren't signed into it or don't want another crowdfunding site. Um, so it takes those kind of hits. Um, so um, I, I, you know, I think the popularity could be affected for that reason, that it's just not going to typically be what a folio was. Uh, it's not way off, but it's not as big as the folio. But then, of course, you're also looking at it as you know very adult oriented. So, um, especially in the the, the Burning City uh, trilogy. So, you know that could affect things. Um, I mean, it has a good draw, um, and I think it has that niche of people who are looking for you know if they're if they're not playing you know, games with their, their kids or stuff like that, or they want to just have a, a more adult version of something. Um, you know, I think it has that appeal and it certainly has its fans. Um, but once it went to Kickstarter for that hardcover, it was my most successful Kickstarter ever. So obviously, even if it was adult, um, it, 
it struck a chord. So maybe if they were always on Kickstarter, they would they would be even better than they were. But nevertheless, that that's where I run them, and that's where um, and that's kind of the way it goes. But um, anyway, and it gives me a good break because when I do the folio, um, it's very you know it's kind of family friendly family friendly and it's just you know anybody can play it and i don't try to get to um you know graphic or political or anything like that it's just good gaming right um but uh it was good when i started the black label a couple of years back to just kind of have something else to write you know what i'm saying that would just right. you know kind of give me a different direction and i once i did that then i was refreshed to come back and do something uh, family friendly again so it, it just it's a trade-off for me uh just a different place for my head to go um as i write adventures because that's what i do every day write adventures um, i could be happy about it. it's pretty cool um but uh nevertheless it's, it's a it's a good divergence and then i got in with um the 13th warlock who does a lot of the artwork now for um uh the black labels which are very very uh uh there, he does I, all the stuff is on computer and uh, very lifelike, uh, but it's kind of fun to work with him too because because he's uh, he's a character uh, and he kind of keeps me on my toes too. So it's <laughs> fun, uh, but yeah. Anyway, so and it's it's a different vein, um, but still within the same framework uh, of a basic folio. You know, you're going to have a cool dungeon, you're going to have a, a storyline that goes with it, uh, and they typically what do they run? You know, thirty. 30 room encounters and some other stuff. And stuff like that. One of the unique things about the folio that I don't think anybody else does is you have it both as 1E and 5E in the same book. I mean, there's some other places where they do like a 1E version and then they do a 5E version and they put them in different books. But you actually put them in the same book, which um, I know for some people, they've started with your books and they started doing it with 5e and then they end up in the osr camp you know because they're they're they like the feel of these adventures because these are definitely old school style adventures but how did you come up with the concept of doing both 1e and 5e in the same book and being able to pull that off so successfully well i played osr um and when you played uh especially the basic edition modules um, of old TSR stuff, they would have uh, stuff blocked, right? Um, and they'd have stat blocks and stuff like that. So I knew it was possible to uh, do a complementary stat block in a different color. And that was fairly easy to just kind of drop in. Um, and I played both 5e and, you know, when 5e came out, it was really kind of funny. People talked to me, uh, and I think you've even said this, like, like, uh, it would be great if you could have your strength, intelligence, wisdom, constitution in the correct order. It's like, right. well, that's, that's the fifth edition order. It's the correct order for AD&D, &D, uh, you know, which is kind of ridiculous. But, uh, you know, and, but just my head does it because I've done it for 40 years. I put them in that order. And I really would like to switch, but I just haven't. You know, it's just that I'm just in, like, I'm in set my ways sometimes. But um, so I knew that you could do it um, very easily. You could kind of drop it in. and. and when, when did fifth edition come out? It was like 2015, you got the beginner's box, somewhere around there, I think. And I got that beginner's box. It was funny because I didn't, when I put it out, it was coming out the exact same time as folio number one. And um, I, there were no monsters really yet. They're just whatever was in the back of the, the pamphlet for the beginner's box. So I'm like, I'm talking with my, my, dm friend mark and we're like trying to come up with these you know what would this thing look like in fifth edition so we were really at the cusp when we started and the initial one i ran um was just uh one e folio one was one e um and then i had like a stretch goal or something where it was you could get a 5e -E pdf version of it um so really if you're a collector and you can find <laughs> folio number one with just one e it's out there somewhere i might have a copy of it so uh but then i ended up doing a reprint later because i ran out of those where i did it as i did in folio two which is i said i'll just put them both in because it's not going to take that much space and i think i think 5e is probably going to be a success yeah <laughs> yeah it was a success uh and it's funny too because i really love you know 
ADD. And I ended up doing, you know, everyone says in the publishing business, the most successful thing you're going to, you're going to do is a monster book. And I was like, okay, I'm going to do a monster book. I'm going to do the, the folio of fiendish monsters. But when I set up the campaign, I'm like, I'm just going to do it in one E. And then as a stretch goal, I will add 5 E into it. Big mistake. That was a huge mistake. Uh, it, it was just terrible. And so I had to put all this work in to make it, you know, 120 new monsters. And, and, you know, it's just a terrible, terrible campaign. And I ended up doing it in 5e too, but people just saw OSR not 5e by that point. Uh, and, and 5e is really, really, really where the money is in publishing. Uh, um, so you just kind of have to include it, but I don't mind it uh, because I play both. So it's very easy for me to do both stats. Um, and like I said, I just put them in the gray blocks and they fit very well, um, for my designers. So, uh, you know, it's good for me and I want to give people the opportunity. Like you said, you might have somebody who only plays AD and D and gets it and sees the 5e and thinks, God, people really like that. Let me just try this. See how it works. Or people that get the 5e version and want to go back and just try the, the basic AD and D. It gives them that, that kind of, you know, go back and forth, but then we've just had the, the new announcement that there'll be a sixth edition. So that, that stresses me out to the wind. Like, I don't know what to do with that. I can't have three stat blocks in it, so I don't know where to go from there, but at least that's a couple of years off. Yeah, it means uh, you're going to have to, to finish uh, the Return to Rosloff Keep before 6E since we're playing <laughs> it in 5E. I mean, it, it puts a timer on you for, for the... Sure, right. tri trilogy of six there uh, yeah hopefully it's pretty back compatible Supposedly you know, I, th I, I think they say it will be so maybe it'd be like 2e versus 1e you can certainly easily play 2e uh, versus 8e so hopefully that's true and it won't take so because so many great products from so many great companies have come out for 5e uh, I'd hate to see that stuff have to go away like it kind of did in third edition where nobody wanted to carry it or anything like that uh, I mean obviously a lot of people transition to just use the pathfinder still it'll be interesting to see and I, I was wondering when that would happen but at least they I, I mean that's a pretty long 20 what is it 2015 to 2024 I think is when they said it was going to come out so nine years is that's reasonable I guess for a new edition I mean that's I don't, I don't think it's the shortest but I don't think it's the longest either Right. Yeah. Yeah. A, a 10 year run, you know, that, that seems about right. And I always figured they would come out with a new edition for the 50th anniversary anyway. Yeah. So it was like, I know something new is going to come out at this point. And when, when they started with the options in Tasha's and then in the following books, that became less an option of, and more just the way it's doing to me, it kind of felt like that we were already in a five, 5.5 5, kind, right. kind of like the unofficial like between one and two like when you started having the dungeoneers got a survival guide and when you had the wilderness survival guide you know you were starting to get that feel of two coming in yep. and it was that same thing and i was like yeah i, I can tell six is six will be here it's, it's coming bad. within a few years so yeah but i i'm happy with what they're what they're doing i think obviously they're they've got good people they know what they're doing. They understand gaming uh, at this point, especially with the big play tests for fifth edition when they were coming off fourth, because I don't know that fourth resounding was a resounding success with anyone. But if they if they continue what they're doing, they should they should be good. I think this will be another fun edition to kind of dig yourself into. Now you talked about reprinting folios one and two. Um, you know, with some of your older orange spines that maybe going out of print are you going to reprint any of those for people who are maybe just finding you and are interested in getting those orange spine you know consolidated folios it'll be interesting you know i mean printing these days is exceptionally expensive especially for somebody like me who does everything in the u.s which again is the reason that my stuff comes out right <laughs> if you print it in china i'm sorry you're screwed you're not going to get your yeah money. your stuff's actually coming out early while all these other people are like hey this is They're this is coming, going to be way late, you know? Way late, yeah. And I don't even know when it's coming in, but it'll be late, yeah. So, I mean, I print my hard covers in Wisconsin and all my soft cover stuff is in Sacramento. So, um, you know, it, it costs me more to do so and I've got small print runs, which is why I run out of stuff. Um, but nevertheless, it is what it is. Uh, on reprinting some of it, it it's going to be interesting to see because 
I'm thinking I might lean more heavily on uh, like uh, for the hard covers, you know, POD uh, through drive through or something like that right. and, and let them deal with that. So my stuff doesn't go out of print um, because I just can't afford, you know, to write out thousands of dollars in checks to, to get something else in um, that may or may not sell. And that's one of the things that you've got with um, like my folios, I don't think I'll reprint because once they get compiled into a, a complete hardcover, the demand for those falls because people want the hardcover um, because it has you know everything together and it has all the bonus mini adventures and all that stuff in it. Um, and it's typically fairly good, easy to collect um, for a better price point than getting each individually. Not individually, I think they're awesome because they have a removable cover and you can put that stuff up and I think it gives you a better view of maps and stuff like that. But, uh, nevertheless, um, I would like to see my stuff uh, reprinted, but it really depends on the overall, you know, success of the crowdfunding pieces for the next hardcover, whatever, you know, the next hardcover would likely be Virgin Mind at some point down the line. So, you know, if it was a, another big success, it would give me an opportunity to, to reprint some of those that have gone out of print. And at this point, after this last Kickstarter, almost everything will go out of print. The only thing I think I'll have left will be Storytellers, Arcana, and uh, Black Label. Everything else will be pretty much gone. All right, yeah. Um, yeah, I kind of wondered about that. And doing the print-on-demand, that's something you can actually do now because, I mean, over the last 10 years, print-on-demand has become so much better than what it was, you know, 10 years ago, it was absolute garbage stuff that was just going to fall apart on you. But now you can get stuff that'll actually, uh, you know, actually stick around so you know it's an option i guess to allow you to continue to sell them without having to right i don't think it'll get i mean it, obviously it'll probably be like in a soft cover version you know mm -hmm. com compiled on pod so i don't know exactly what it'll look like i don't think it'll be i mean it's not going to be one of the kind of collector's items that i've put together hardcover wise uh, but it will give you all the great content and be easy to use and you can have a physical version so uh that's something that i'm looking into over like the next couple of months and we'll see. All right. Yeah, I understand what you mean because having the folios is nice because of the, having the maps there and having your separate gazetteer and everything. Yeah. I mean, it's so convenient for the DM. So just a second. <coughs> Sorry about that. Somehow, when I interviewed Zach last week, I ended up getting his cold through Zoom. <laughs> <laughs> Don't know how that happened. <laughs> um, so you said Virgin Mind will probably be the. Um, the next hardcover what what do you have what are you looking for in the future and then your next year what what art of the genre is looking to do well um that's tough i mean you know i folio 28 will be halfway through uh the virgin mind so i would like to see the virgin mind end next year i'd like to get three more of those out um, I'd like to get uh, the first of the new trilogies for the Black Label out, so that'd be seven, eight, nine, and then I would like to get the the new trilogy, the OSR trilogy, uh, Ice on the Water. I would like to see that come out, and then uh, obviously uh, crowdfunding another hardcover next year. I'm assuming that would probably be in August. Um, I would like it to be earlier, but I don't know that I'll get all these pieces out before he, because the, the thing that will happen with the Virgin Mind is, and I'm sure you've noticed this if you played any of the Virgin Mind, that um, like each, uh, each dungeon uh, is, you know, connects, right? And then in the middle, there's stuff, there's like rooms, and you're like, I don't know what those rooms are. Like, they're not, they're not in my module. Yeah. Um, because when you get all the pieces together, it opens that final seventh dungeon. Um, and that will be a separate piece now. Uh, and I'll probably release that piece, um, as, uh, uh, a free PDF or something like that. Um, just so everyone can have it unless I want to actually put out a, a folio for it. But, um, I would release it as a free PDF if, um, I only do, um, a hardcover version of the complete Virgin Mind. 
uh, and then it would be in there. But I don't want to deny anyone. I don't want to force somebody to buy a hardcover, right? If they've got all the other stuff. So right. uh, I would give them the, the you know, you, you could get it on the website or something for free. Um, and then you could finish off your campaign if you didn't want the hardcover. Uh, or I could do a folio for it, but um, because it'll basically be the same size as a, a dungeon by the end of it as a regular one and out series. So we'll see how that goes. I mean, that's my plan. Um, I just haven't as to what my time is like, so what, uh, so, you know, obviously people's reception of these kind of, you know, turns my course. If, if all of a sudden demand falls off for them, then, you know, I have to do something different than what I would think I could do. But if people are just going bonkers for it, then obviously we could do something else that's even bigger and more fantastic. So and the, the last, I mean, Folio 27 was a huge success for me. I think it was my most successful Folio ever. So knock wood. Um, that continues and people like the series uh, and they like 28 just as much and want to continue on. If that's the case, we'll probably go to something really kind of epic at the end. And Travis uh, Hansen did those uh, maps for me. I think those are just great maps off of mine. I mean, I drew them out. <laughs> you know, like, this is kind of what I want, Travis. Can you do that? And it's like, yeah, we'll put that together. So, anyway, it was, it was cool. Um, so, one other thing, uh, speaking of those maps, you know, you do 2D maps and 3D maps for all of your stuff. Where did you come up with that concept? I mean, it's so, it's what, one of your many things you do in the folio that makes things so much easier for the DM. How'd you come up with that? You were going to do that for every adventure you have. You're going to have a 2D and you're going to have your 3D as well. Well, it was a weird thing. Um, I, I, so many things have just happened to me that are just, just kind of fall into place. I, you know, I was doing, um, I did Folio 1, I had the map for it, um, and my editor, Scott Swift, um, I gave him the map and said, you know, this is the module, can you edit it? And he was like, yeah, I can do that. He was like, wouldn't you want, rather have this map blue, you know, like an actual textile map? And I was like, well, yeah, I'd like it, but I can't do that. He was like, I can do it, I'll just do it, uh, along with my editing. <laughs> I was like, okay, so that's how I got the blue maps done. Uh, hex wise, like an old school, an OSR uh, piece. And then um, Andrew Rogers, who's my uh, designer who came over with me from Guy Gax Magazine, um, he looked at the first map and he was like, Hey, you want this 3D? I was like, what are you talking about? 3, 3D? Are you serious? And he's like, Yeah. He's like, Yeah, I, I can do that in 3D. I was like, and, you know, and I was like, okay do it in 3d and then he did this insane artistic 3d map because he does it all by hand because he's all, not only is he a great designer uh, he's a fantastic designer but he's also a really great artist um so he takes that design and, and is able to 3 3d vision it and, and when you put it on that when you put it on the you know the fold out and put it in front of you it's it's awesome you know, it just makes it. it. It's funny because I look at a lot of uh, adventures that I get or something through Kickstarter uh, for, for fifth edition or stuff like that. And I'm, I look at it and I'm just like, my stuff is trash. My stuff is, these guys are just so awesome. You know, what, what they're doing or how many pages or whatever they got in, you know. But uh, then, then I'll go back and I'll look at mine and I'll say, yeah, mine's pretty cool too. I do things that other people don't. Um, so... You know, I wish more people could see it uh, because I don't think I have, you know, the, I, I just, so I don't typically go to um, conventions, mm -hmm. but I just think if, if sometime I could get myself to Gen Con or something like that, and I could set up a table and somebody could get one of these in their hands, they'd lose their mind. Because you don't know what it's like when you see a little banner on Kickstarter or something or on Facebook that says this is where right. it is. But when you actually hold one of them and that, that inside slides out, and you're like, you know, transported to 1982, or you see that 3D map and you're like, wow, seriously, this is what I'm looking at? Um, I think people would get a much bigger kick out of it or holding a, an orange spine hardcover in your hand. I mean, that's, that's a big deal. And, and a lot of it is tactile, a lot of it is visual. And unfortunately, I, I don't have the wherewithal to get out to those things. But I think they would, I think, that once people get their hands on them, I, I get a lot of loyal fans. Let's say that people that keep coming back because it is uh, some it is kind of an experience. 
Yeah, I definitely think that if you were to get to the cons, you know, Gen Con, yes, but even like North Texas or Gary Texas. Con or anything like that, or Game Hole. And Which is you, this weekend, right? Yes, exa- exactly. I, and people could see that stuff. I, I think, yeah, it would jump through the roof because once people find your stuff, they – they're like, oh yeah, okay, I, I'm a fan of this for life because I just love the way everything is done. Um, yeah, if you could get out to the cons, I think I, mean, I think you would see sales just fly through the roof. I, I can't see how they wouldn't. I, I, that would be the hope, right? You know, right. I keep thinking that, but you know, then I'd go through, it's, you know, to get there and transport all that stuff with pallets and you're like, make that money back. You know, it's, it's a big investment. You have to get in. A lot of these cons now is too, I mean, it's hard to get in to get a vendor table. At, at the big ones so anyway that's it's always a dream of mine but yeah we'll see if it happens that's true like a bunch of people were able to display at gen con this year that normally couldn't because so many people had to back out you know because right. it was so, so much later because they put it back yeah yep yeah um so there's been other things that you've done to make it easier for a dm you've come up with like uh your um your mob of monsters rules or your magic rules which were in display on Curse of the Rosloff Keep. That's where you really introduced those. And again, just time savers. So when did you first originally come up with these ideas like in your home game and then decide to introduce them into the folio? Because that's something I picked up and I'm like, I'm running with this always now, you know, no matter what I'm doing. Well, um, I went to Gen Con, uh, you know, I've been to Gen Con many times, but I, I was at Gen Con once and I'd spent a week playing Savage Worlds before Gen Con, because Gen Con is in Indiana, and that's where I'm from. So all my my high school buddies are in Indiana, so we get together and we just game uh, when I come out there. So I kind of make it a you know a two week trip, and uh, I, we we played Savage Worlds, and we just went bonkers on it. And uh, I so I get to Gen Con, and Shane Hensley is there who's designed Savage Worlds, and I, I was like Shane. It, I just got to tell you, we played this game nonstop for a week. This is, you know, so awesome. He did such a great job uh, with this, with the mechanic. And, and he was like, don't, you know, don't give me too much credit. I'm just a lazy DM. And, you know, I, when he said that, it was really kind of fundamental to me um, because it is, it's great to be um, a DM. Uh, do you know Seth Sarkowski? Have you ever seen uh-huh. his video? Okay, so he, he put out a video just last week, uh, and I, it was on, you know, player fights or something. I don't even know what it was. You know, I can't remember off the top of my head what it, the exact concept was. But at the beginning of it, um, he's there, you know, role-playing himself, obviously, behind the screen. And then he's got his various players in the old plays, too. He's awesome. But anyway, he, and they're like, hey, that was a great session. See you later. And they're, he's like, oh, yeah, see you, see you. And they all, they all get up to leave. And then at the after it, it's just him. And you see him do, you know, he just goes, and, and that's the thing, like, and that was the most genius part of the whole thing for me is as a DM, people don't understand just how hard it is, how mentally fatiguing it is. And that's just for running the game, not the week leading up to the game, not all the prep and the stats and the blocks and everything that you have to do to get ready to make that a successful session and his side told me everything in that moment. And I just absolutely agreed with it. It is hard. And, and when Shane said, you know, I'm a lazy DM and the way he designed um, Savage Worlds, it was like, there's a lot of accounting that goes on as a DM. And the, the, the more I can help a DM not have to be an accountant, the more fun it is for them. And so when I went and looked at those, when I created the things that you're talking about, those mechanics of, uh, you know, swarm attacks or, you know, those kind of things, anything that'll allow you as a DM to move the encounter along, still maintain the threat, but not have to be, not have to sit there with your adding machine, you know, as you're going through it. Uh, or, you know, this is my third piece of paper as I'm writing down all these, you know, hit points, uh, losses of hit points. And I think that's one of the things that, um, you see with um, 
with D&D, it can, there's a lot of accounting. So, well, and that's one of the things that you've looked at that I completely is out of my head at this particular point is, is that I'm also looking next year to put out a simple system, which is my new RPG. There you go. Thanks for leading me into that one. And I completely missed it. <laughs> you know, uh, you know uh, but uh, yeah, so that was one of the things I was looking at when I was designing the system uh, was just the ability for the DM to have more fun with it. And for encounters like Savage Worlds to be uh, to play a lot faster, and, and so that's why it's some of the rule changes that I put in in, in my various modules uh, in the folios come into play because they're just to move the game along and give the DM a little bit more of a break. Right, that's, and it, it's definitely one of the things I mentioned it um, with Zach last week and with you this week. Both of you obviously. DM regularly and you create your products for ease of use for a DM. And I, I think so many products today are being put out by people who are maybe just making products, but aren't actually playing them. And, you know, they're like, oh, okay, well, yeah, I'll do this. I'll do this, but it doesn't play as well. And when you have a DM designer, I think it's just, it just makes some things so much easier and so much more enjoyable for both that, for that DM and for the players themselves. It's just, it, it's a really nice way of doing things. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, so you mentioned that a simple system will be coming out. Will that be coming out via Kickstarter or? I assume so. I, I'm going to kickstart it. I mean, it, it should be crowdfunded. Um, I might I might go in with, uh, might do my first backer kit, which I've never done before um, on it. Um, but I've got, you know, obviously great artwork coming along in it. And, I, you know, we continue to do uh, fine tuning and beta testing on uh, the system itself. Um, but nevertheless, yeah, that is something that we're looking at. It, it, it will be crowdfunded for sure. Uh, is there anything you want to tell people about what a simple system will be about? Obviously, I know stuff, but I, I, I kind of signed an NDA on this. So <laughs> I, I can't say anything, but right. so whatever you want to share. Uh, you know, I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's going to be, uh, it's D10 based. So, uh, in, and in percentiles, um, and I really tried to strip out a lot of the, um, just the minutia of accounting in it and make it easier, um, uh, for the DM to, to go through and make encounters more, uh, cinematic. Um, so you can like, uh, you could you know, you could move through a combat very quickly um, with lower level you know uh, NPCs or uh, what I call fodder folk. Uh, you just kind of you know get them out of my way. I'm coming through until you get to the you know the the kind of more boss battles. So you don't have to spend two hours fighting ten skeletons. You know because you're just hacking away. At, you know I only did two points that time or whatever. You know. Uh, so that was really what I was looking at in the system um, and kind of making a uniform uh, series of damage, either light, medium or heavy damage systems. And um, I don't know, I think we put together a pretty good system. Uh, the, there, there's always going to be, I think, some, some blowback um, in percentile based systems because people have a hard time. Mm -hmm. um, understanding percentages versus, you know, if I only, I need a 15 or better to hit, you right. know, is 25% chance, right? But if mm -hmm. you tell somebody they got a 25% chance to hit, they're like, that sucks. I don't want a 25, but a 15 or better, they're good with. I don't know why that is, <laughs> but it's the way, you know, uh, it reminds me, it was like, um, so I think it was like Burger King or somebody came out with a third of a pound burger, right? Mm -hmm. And people didn't want it because they wanted the quarter pounder because it was bigger. Right. Yeah, because, because they, they just don't know. They, they, you know, it's just that thing. Like people thought, you know, a third of a panel, that's no good. That, that's smaller than the quarter. Pan. <laughs> so, uh, you know, it's just the way people perceive things. But I think um, in playing the system, uh, once you get used to the mechanic and you can do the percentiles, um, I think it makes a lot of sense. So anyway, uh, and I'll have three really great settings in it um, that I'll, I'm constantly expanding on to. Um, so there'll be, you know, encounters and modules and stuff like that that will also be uh, in the book. Uh, really? and then I, customizable, oh, customizable, again, customizable magic is also something in there where magic becomes more of a force instead of a spell. 
So um, once you have that system out, uh, will the folio get a third stat block for adventure so they can play it in that? Or are you going to keep a simple system separate from the 1E and 5E of the folio? I don't want to really tinker too much with the folios. Um, I, I, I think I'll put them out the way that they have been out. But the caveat to that is I might put out uh, an actual just simple system version. Of right. The uh, maybe it might not be in print. It might just be PDF versions uh, at low cost to people. So, you know, a couple bucks, you can get a folio PDF of Simple System so you can play it. Because again, uh, Simple System is very simple and, and trading in stat blocks, uh, you know, from a, a you know mechanical point of view isn't too difficult. Right. The writing of the adventure is difficult. The dungeon is, you know, all those things are what really takes a lot out of uh, the writer, but just sort of switching it, uh, a stat block isn't too bad. Right. Well, we have hit an hour. I could probably still ask you tons of questions, <laughs> but I want to give you your time back. So, right. why don't you let everybody know how they can find you, uh, how they find art on the genre, art of the genre, how they can find you on social media, these type of things. Uh, yeah, I mean, art of the genre. You can look it up on it's. We're on Facebook under art of the genre. Um, artofthegenre.com, uh, no spaces, just artofthegenre.com uh, is my website. And we've got any of our products that aren't out of print are still all, are, are there and all of our new products will come out. We do, have, um, uh, we do have digital content there as well, but, and you can also find us on DriveThruRPG, all of our stuff is digitally on DriveThruRPG. So uh, those are the places you can find us. And uh, obviously if you go to Facebook or something like that, I, I, we're on Twitter too under Art of the Genre. Um, and on Instagram, so all of those you can you can find it if you have a question or or want to see uh, kind of what we're doing or anything like that. Um, and I'll be happy to to chat. All right. Well, thanks for taking an hour out of your day yeah, uh, to talk fun. with me today, and hopefully a couple people understand that you've got some really great products out there, and if they haven't picked them up yet, that they should definitely do so. Right, and Black Label number seven is on Indiegogo right now for the next like three days. So if anybody sees that, if, you, if you're on Indiegogo, go check us out. All right, well, thank you again, Scott. All right, thank you.